Tim, if you'll advance it to verse 19, since we preached, I preached on 15 to 18 last week, I'm going to start in verse 19 with the reading today. This is the word of God from Galatians 3, verses 19, verse 19 through 4, 7. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made and was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Not an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is the powerful and amazing Word of God. You may be seated. And let's open our time with prayer. Heavenly Father, your word is powerful, amazing, and true. And these words are full. They're heavy. They're rich. They're promising. And so, Holy Spirit, we hope and pray and ask in Jesus' name that you would would open our hearts to receive and our minds to receive, that we might be strengthened and helped and live by all your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know, today is Graduate Blessing Sunday, and it, it, I thought, if I thought about it hard enough, uh, what would I want to say to kind of, to kind of anchor the graduates in, in, uh, in, in order to anchor their souls and, and all of our souls in, in, in a defining paradigm for life? I couldn't do any better than to take us through the epistle to the Galatians. Um, here in, it, in, in, in this epistle, we, we contemplate the awesome gospel of God and, and of God's grace to us in Jesus Christ. And, and that, is, that is the paradigm that we embrace for living. So, so it's good timing, graduates and everyone else. And last week, uh, as we began to look through this passage in verse 15 and 8 to 18, we saw that Paul, what Paul had to say to uh, to to us about God's dealings with Abraham and the promise that he made there. We walked through that. We looked at it. We went back to Genesis and and we considered it. It was a a promise, a covenant promise that that Paul keeps referring to here in in Galatians. And and so we looked at that. And we saw that the basis for our salvation and his salvation, our, our acceptance of God, his acceptance of God was that he believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness and that by faith our Acceptance to God comes through faith and not through works of the law. As it said, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Verse 18 summed it up. It uh, said, for if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So, incredibly, God said those who are of faith are, are, are sons of Abraham, spiritual sons of Abraham. That's true of the Jew, that's true of the non-Jew. 
Only faith counts. That's what Paul is saying. At this point of Galatians then, Paul anticipates where we are today. He anticipates kind of the logical question that would follow. If obedience to God's law isn't how we commend ourselves to God, then what's the use of the law? It's like Paul had been anticipating that. Whatever the reason God commands us to uh, his people how to live, it can't be for our, to, to receive acceptance by him. The promise comes through faith, not through obeying the law. That's what we've been looking at. That's the struggle that is happening in Galatians as they are being... Uh, tempted to listen to some teachers that are saying you need to tack the law onto that gospel to be accepted by God, to continue to grow in that relationship with him. So Paul's letter reaches its crescendo here in this passage that we've just read. It it, it really comes to a crescendo at the end of chapter 3 and into chapter 4, what we just looked at. And there's so much, in fact, there's so much splendor to this idea of adoption or or sonship that I want to give it a whole sermon. So we're going to get to that next week. Astonishingly, we find that through faith in Jesus, we're not just spiritual children of Abraham. We're, we're, We're children, we're sons of God. We're going to save an unpacking of that for next week. So first off today, then, let's look at at sort of this pink elephant that's been in the room as we walk through Galatians, as as Paul knows they're sitting there going, okay, wait a minute, the law isn't part of... Keeping the law is not what we're doing to be accepted by God. Why then the law? And Paul sees that pink elephant, and he, he, he anticipates their thinking and our thinking, and he says... In verse 19, why then the law? He asks it for them. And then he answers it. Why then the law, he says, it was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. In other words, until Jesus Christ came. Last week we looked at Paul's reference to Christ as the coming offspring. Remember, it's kind of a strange thing. You wouldn't normally get it if you read Genesis. But but Paul says the interpretation of that is the promise was to Abraham and to his offspring, singular, meaning Christ. But what we saw was that and, and uh, what we saw was that that was it comes through Christ. It was always the intention. But this morning we're considered we're concerned more about the follow up question: Why the law? Why the law? If it's by faith that we come to God, if it's by faith in the gospel that we grow in grace, why the law? It was given not to tell us how to be saved, but to show us that we have a hopelessly insurmountable problem. We're all lawbreakers. And there's nothing we can do on our own to fix it. You know, as bad as that news is, it gets worse before it gets better. The law can't give anyone life. Look at verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. See, God knew when he gave the law that nobody was going to be able to keep it except his son. And that's shocking when you think about it because he gave the law and he said, the one who does them shall live, shall live by them. Sounds to me like it can impart life. But God knew that it couldn't. See, the law, that that was quoting uh, from Leviticus 18.5, The law could give life if anyone could keep it, but no one can, so it can't. The law was given by God, but it can't impart life. So what exactly does the law accomplish? It can't save us. It can't give us life. It can't commend us to God because we can't keep it. Well, concerning God's plan to redeem a people for himself, this is what it did, verse 22. This is, 
the scripture, the law, the scripture, imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. It imprisoned everything under under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The law shows us that we don't just fall short of the glory of God a little bit so that if we just try a little harder, we might just make it. If that were true, then the law would be contrary to the promise. Instead, the law spotlights and even validates the wonder of God's grace by the promise. Because the law points us to faith in God's promise as the locus of justification before God. Faith as the locus of justification before God. Which for us, on this side of the cross, means faith in Jesus Christ. So why then the law? It leads us straight to the conclusion that we can't attain righteousness by our own effort, by our own merit. And that's Paul's point. He's, he's trumping again the Judaizers who are saying, now God will be... Be accept, you'll be acceptable to God by getting circumcised and, and following these ceremonies and doing these things. And, and, and Paul is saying, no. It's of grace through faith in Christ. The law works to lead us to recognize our poverty, to recognize our deadness when it comes to deserving God's acceptance. But, says Paul, the law isn't contrary to the promise. Instead, it supports the promise by pointing us to salvation by grace through faith in Christ. Paul would later put it like this in Philippians 3, verse 9, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. That's certainly a central point or purpose of the law. It's not the only purpose of the law, but it's, but it's certainly a centrally important point because it's the one that highlights, that spotlights the gospel and our need for God's grace. This is so important for the church today to understand because so often the church tries to, to soften, to, to, to sugarcoat the law, which is pointing us to the gospel. And when we ignore or downplay or sugarcoat the law of God, we inadvertently dilute the power of the gospel. You know, I think uh, as I was preparing, I started thinking, you know, we, we post the Ten Commandments over here, the law. The moral law of God, summarized in the Ten Commandments. And, and it made me start thinking about, you know, in our culture, there's this, this uh, sort of cultural battle going on on uh, can we post the Ten Commandments at, at, you know, government buildings and especially courthouses. And, and there was one place where it was, por- it was actually, they were posted in the courtroom. And I was kind of studying this and thinking about that. You know, that is, that is so striking to me. Because here is this court of law where, where somebody is coming and maybe they're guilty, maybe they're not, of some crime and they're being tried. And everyone in the room is either the judge, the jury, the, the attorneys or, or, or observers or the person on trial. And there on the wall is this document posted. And what does that document do? It says, hey, all of you people in the courtroom, you're all guilty. Every one of you are guilty. And you know what? Every one of you deserves the death penalty. It just struck me. I'm not trying to say anything about... It just, I wonder if anybody looks at it that way. Paul was looking at it that way. Here in Galatians, in this, as he wrote this uh, part of Galatians. Well, in our text, uh, he goes on with two metaphors. Uh, 
that illustrate the purpose of the law. He, he compares it to prison and to a tutor or a guardian. Uh, the idea of a prison kind of puts it in a bad light, doesn't it? The law is a prison. And that's not one we want to kind of embrace. But, but, but it has to be weighed that way. It has to be weighed that way because that's what highlights and spotlights the, the good news of the gospel. And again, if we sugarcoat that, we diminish the power of the gospel. Through the law, sin gained power over us so that, so that we know we're sinners in God's sight. If, if we didn't have the law, we wouldn't see the need to be set free from the power of sin. So although the law, Paul says here, the scripture imprisons us under the guilt of our sin, it points us again to the way of freedom. Through the promise, through faith in Jesus Christ, the promises of, of, of eternal life, of, of, of reconciliation, justification before God is given to those who believe, verse 22. And then Paul says in verse 24 that the law is our guardian. This is the second metaphor, a guardian until Christ came. So prison, guardian, or tutor might be the right idea. I think it's kind of a blend of both. It, it, it does have a teaching role like a tutor, but it also has sort of a, an oversight role like a guardian does. The, the, the word uh, that's used there is it, the Thayer's Greek lexicon, which is sort of an older lexicon, but he's pretty thorough. He says this about this word. He says, among the Greeks and Romans... This title or this word was applied to trustworthy slaves who were charged with the duty of supervision, supervising the life and the morals of boys belonging to the better class. The boys were not allowed so much as to step out of the house without them before they reached the age of manhood. That's what this word is, is, is that's what the law is to us. It is, it is that one supervising us and, and, and leading us to the time that, 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 the, that faith comes. And we understand the gospel. And, and, and we, it's our guardian tutor. It communicates uh, the fact that we're all sinners. And that we have nothing we can do about it. That we've got to turn to the gospel. It also communicates the very nature of God. That's one of the things that it does for us. It, it communicates His his. Uh, his justice and his moral purity. And it makes us look to Jesus Christ for grace. So even when by faith we're no longer under a tutor, as it says in verse 25, we, we continue to, to learn to live as God's children by the law. Because we want to reflect God's nature. We know and understand Him. We, we know what His desire is. We know who He is. And, you know, when I was a child, uh, I learned my parents' moral rules. And, and, and I obeyed them uh, a lot. <laughs> and a lot of times I obeyed them because I was fearful of what will happen if I don't. But more, I obeyed them because I loved my parents and I knew their love for me. And when I became a man... I was no longer under their moral authority. But did I then cast off that moral law, that moral teaching that they gave me? No. That would have been foolish. But surely an even greater reason why I kept their morals was because I knew their love for me. And I love them. Likewise, the law still reveals to me the nature of my Heavenly Father, whose love for me I have come to know, who I love, whose love I have come to cherish, and whom I want to emulate as much as possible. Not to win His favor. That's not at all what it's about. Not to win His favor. But motivated by grateful love for Him. Not from obligatory sense of duty, but because of the kindness of God. Because of the power of the Gospel. The Gospel is God's love experienced and enjoyed in the depths of our being. And the Gospel energizes power within us for a transformed and transforming life. Christian, do you remember a time when Christ became real to you?
when you grasp the truth that, uh, of the gospel, that Jesus' death on the cross was actually the death that you deserved, but He paid. When, when the reality struck you that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was really showing that there is life after this life, and that only through Christ do you enter into that eternal life with God. Do you remember when you encountered all of this gospel truth as, a, as an amazing display of God's love for you personally and Christ's love for you personally? I remember at age 16 when I first encountered, remember encountering Christ's love so richly and dramatically. I, I'd known it through early years, but, but, it, but it came sort of to this crystallization and explosion of, of dynamism in, in, a, in a youth camp. And I was stirred by Christ's love for me. And it made me want to repent of all my sin. And you know what? It gave me the power to repent of sins that had power over me up until that point. Not as my duty, but as my joy, as, my, as an outworking of my love for Christ who loved me so profoundly, so powerfully manifested in the Gospel. How about you? Maybe, maybe your experience was like that. Maybe it was somewhat different. But one thing I know... The desire to forsake sin and the power to forsake sin come through the gospel, both to you and to me. And that's not going to change. The law opens our eyes and points us to that. And thank God, what a grace. It tells us even some about our Father. But all the law can do really is show us our own inability. It's still the power of faith and the pure gospel that sets us free from remaining sin in our lives. And that's why the gospel must never become old or trivial to us. You know, it's been said that the default demeanor of, of human beings is self-justifying religion or irreligion, which is still just a self-justifying kind of approach to life. Even... When we're believers, like these Galatians, there's this temptation to, to after, after believing the gospel, to return to a self-justifying system of works to, to commend ourselves to God. But Paul says this about that in verse 3 of chapter 3, Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? You see, the gospel is power, the power of God for transform life and for transforming life. The law is good, especially because it drives us to hope in the gospel. And unless we keep both works of grace in mind, the, the, the grace in saving us and the grace in transforming us, then we'll live an anxious life. We, we might say, yeah, my slate was wiped clean, but we have this sense that, of anxiety because I, it, there's, I'm just never measuring up to what God is, is expecting of me if I've got this system of works that I put in place. And Paul is seeking to steer us away from that kind of thinking. And we never move on from the gospel. We move more and more deeply into it. Yes. You know, the book of Hebrews, I, I don't know if you've read that recently, but uh, in, there's a place in chapter 6 that I was always kind of, I almost chuckle when I read it now. Uh, the writer, the author of Hebrews is saying, uh, hey, let's, uh, let's, let's get away from the basics of the gospel and all this stuff about you know, washings and, 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 and all these things and move on to more mature things. And what does he do? Does he move away, away from the gospel? No, he goes way deeper into the gospel for the next five chapters. Because he knows the gospel never becomes irrelevant. We never set it aside. The law can't save us. The law can't impart life to us. The law can't even sanctify us, though it isn't useless in any of these things. But it's grace through faith 
in the gospel, that's the power of God for a transformed life as the Holy Spirit works it in us by his grace. I want to um, introduce just the last point today and elaborate on it next week. I, I don't have time to do it justice, but it's, uh, it's um, too rich of an idea. It's too extraordinary of an idea, uh, of a truth, of a doctrine. Uh, what we're about to look at, and, and graduates, come back next week. Everybody come back next week, Lord willing, because we're going to look at what is the mainspring of Christian living. The idea of sonship. Or as the Bible and theologians call it, the idea of our adoption. Believers are sons of God and heirs through God. You know, we find that through faith in Jesus Christ, we're not merely sons of Abraham or children of Abraham. We're sons of God. Now, let me just introduce it today and then we'll pick it up next week. Look at verse 26. says, for, let's see, my, get my context to adjust here. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. What did he say? You're all what? You're all sons of God. Now if you ask the man on the street, is every human being a, a child of God? He would say, of course. But if you ask Paul... He would say, of course not. We're all sons through faith. Now that might strain your political corrected, correctness uh, sensibilities a little bit. Couldn't we translate it as some do, we're all children of God or we're all sons and daughters of God? In a sense, yes. But you would, you would lose something from the meaning of the text if you do that. And what you lose is you have to go back into that day and into that culture and you have to realize that the daughters didn't inherit the estate. The sons did. So what is Paul saying? You're all male and female sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. You're all heirs. You all inherit all that belongs to God. All that belongs to Christ. Co-heirs with Christ, he would write in another place. Can you imagine that? Let that sink in. That's, a, that, that's, that's crazy thinking. Wonderful. Crazy thinking. True. Wonderful. Blessed thinking. If you're still struggling with that son's idea, let me just throw this in. This is just for fun. We men have to struggle with one too. There's a metaphor in Scripture that we don't want to do, do away with, just like we don't want to do away with the sons. The church is the bride of Christ. Guys, especially you macho guys, how do you feel about being a bride? You don't want to do away with that one. Trust me. So we got the same thing. Paul is... Uh, Paul is not a chauvinist. He's very egalitarian on his vocabulary here. We've, verse 27 says something else that's profound. It says that we have put on Christ. We've put on Christ. We've clothed ourselves in Christ. I want to close with this idea. We've clothed ourselves with Christ. Maybe you remember somebody saying to you, or, or you've said it yourself, when, in a sense, when our Heavenly Father looks at us, He sees His Son. He sees Jesus. We're clothed with Christ. I don't know about you, but that's an incredible comfort to me. That's an amazing truth. I, Father, you look at me, you see Jesus. I'm clothed with Christ. If you're a believer, you're clothed with Christ. That'll take you through this week until we come next week and hear more of this astonishingly wonderful news that we are sons of God. Come back. Let's, let's, let's walk through this together. But for now, let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for giving us the law that we can't keep. 
so we might know a love that we can't fathom and grace that lifts us. Thank you, Lord, for making us sons of God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.